virtual launch of Lucille Mathurin Mayer, the latest publication in the Caribbean Biography series published by the University of the West Indies Press. We're live streaming today from the UE regional headquarters, and we extend a special welcome to all of you. Allow me to introduce you to those who will be participating in today's program, as well as some special guests. We have with us Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, Most Honorable Percival James Pattison, former Prime Minister of Jamaica, and statesman in residence at the PJ Patterson Center for African Caribbean Advocacy right here at the university. His Excellency Patrick Robinson, judge of the International Court of Justice. We also have with us Vice Chancellor Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. We have with us as well Ambassador Gail Matherin, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Professor Garin Shepherd, author and historian, Ms. Stephanie Sewell, Mrs. Nadine Buckland, acting manager of the UE Press, Dr. Delia Bean, Kabu Mahat Karu, Jeanette Campbell, Dr. Mr. David Matherin, who is the son of Lucille Mayer, Matherin Mayer. We also have Mr. Adrian Matherin, who is another son, members of the University of the West Indies Management and Hierarchy. We have the UE Press Board of Directors joining us as well. Other specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends, all welcome. So the Caribbean Biography Series from the University of the West Indies Press celebrates and memorializes the architects of Caribbean culture. The series aims to introduce general readers to those individuals who have made sterling contributions to the region in their chosen field literature, the arts, politics, sports, etc., and are the shapers and bearers of Caribbean identity. The Lucille Mathurin Mayer biography is the seventh book in the series and honors the life and work of a phenomenal woman while providing us with never before published accounts to rightfully acknowledge and document and also celebrate her previously uncredited contributions to the UE, the United Nations, and also as a legislator and a pioneer in women's rights activism, among other achievements. Time has definitely come to honor a true rebel woman, and thank you for joining us this evening for that. Before we get into the program, however, we would like to acknowledge a man who made this series possible and whose work and memory we definitely salute. I am inviting all of us, those with us in person here and online to join us for a moment of silence in honor of Dr. Joseph B. Powell, who was the former general manager of the UA Press who passed on recently. Asking you to join us for a moment of silence. Thank you. May his soul rest in peace and our best wishes to his family, friends, and colleagues. We now have the pleasure of hearing from Ms. Nadine, Mrs. Nadine Buckland, who is the Acting General Manager of the UA Press, who will deliver the publisher's remarks. And allow me to introduce her a bit via her, her um, bio. Okay, it seems <laughs> I get a little assistance here. Thank you very much. Nadine Bucklan is an SME and nonprofit financial management expert with experience in the telecommunication, aviation, and publishing industries. Currently, she is acting general manager of the UA Press. She has served on numerous committees of the Association of University Presses and was a treasurer and a member of the board of directors from 2017 to 2019. In 2015, she was the host of the first AU Press's financial officers meeting to be held outside of North America in Montego Bay, Jamaica. 
Mrs. Buckland is an active member of the Association of Learned Professionals, Society Publishers, Independent Publishers Guild, UK, and the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. She's currently serving as a mentor at WIPO, APNET, that's the African Publishers Network, if I'm correct, mentorship program for African publishers. Please welcome Nadine. of Barbados, Most Honorable P.J. Patterson, former Prime Minister of Jamaica and Statesman in Residence at the P.J. Patterson Center for African Caribbean Advocacy, the UWI, His Excellency Patrick Robinson, Judge of the International Court of Justice, The Hague, the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Ambassador Gail Matherin, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Professor Fareen Shepard, mem um, distinguished guests, members of the Lucille Matherin Mayor's family, colleagues and friends. It is my distinct pleasure to bring the remarks on behalf of the University of the West Indies Press at this virtual launch. As publishers of the Caribbean biography series, which celebrates and memorializes the architect of Caribbean culture, we are delighted to feature this afternoon the distinguished contribution of Lucille Mathering Mayer. She stands among great men and women in the series, in the likes of Earl Lovelace, Derek Walcott, Marcus Garvey, Una Marson, Beryl McBurney, Stuart Hall, and soon to be published, Amy Césaire. Other proposed subjects will include CLR James and Camus Brathwaite. The Caribbean biography series was modeled from the short biography on Abraham Lincoln, authored by James McPherson. And I recall quickly um, ordering sample copies just so we could see exactly what these look like. The idea to publish Lucille Matherin's Mayor as the subject in the series was proposed by a subcommittee of the UWI Press Board of Directors led by series editor Funzo Aingina and his team. The committee, along with Dr. Joseph Powell, former general manager, of the UWI Press, concluded that Mathering Mayer's pioneering work in women's studies at the UWI, which led to her appointment at the United Nations, was worthy of recognition in the series. Joseph, who also was our chief acquisition editor, concluded that there was no one more fitting to pen this contribution than the esteemed social historian Professor Vereen Shepherd, who worked with Mothering Mayor at various points in her career. In the words of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, second female justice appointed to the UWI, sorry, that should be the US Supreme Court, my mother told me to be a lady. And for her, that meant to be your own person, be independent. Mathering Mayer was our example of that lady. Mathering Mayer was a scholar, an advocate, and a lady. Embedded in the vast ecosystem of global knowledge, research, and universities throughout the world are university presses. University presses are beacon of light, carrying the mantle of presenting diverse network of voices of research about Caribbean culture, culture and its people to the 
world. But the university presses are facing challenges. Currently magnified by the COVID-19 pandemic, remote work issues, limiting internet, internet infrastructure, shifting business models, bureaucracy that sometimes challenges advancement of innovations and creativity. In spite of this, we seek to announce to all the value offered by the UWI Press in research integrity, courage, its extension of the university's mission and brand, and its role in supporting the strategic pillars of the university in research output that we are celebrating today. So in celebration of the work of Lucille Mathering Mayor, I end with a quote from Anne Frank. Everyone has inside of her a piece of good news. The good news is that you don't know how great you can be, how much you love, what you can accomplish, what is your potential. But the UWI Press will be there to record your journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadine. One of the things I miss about live events is, you know, just the round of applause. I know we would all have given just now a full room, appreciating that testament to the work and um, the contribution that is being made. Now, I also have some good news for those who are on the live with us. We are pleased to announce that the UA Press is making all the books in the Caribbean Biography Series available at a special discount, a 50% discount. If you use a promotional code, B, and that code is 03SMR21, and you can use that at the checkout on their website, which is uapress.com. Of course, conditions apply, and you can find out what those conditions are at the website. Also, you can reach out to their marketing team if you'd like to make bulk orders or purchases, like to donate these to schools or to community libraries, please reach out to uapress.mktg at uemona.edu.jm for further details and assistance. And so moving along on the program, we are going to be inviting the Vice Chancellor, Sir Hilary Beckles, to come and address us at the occasion of this launch. And before I do so, let me just introduce you for those of you who don't know this man, but I'm sure there, there are not many on this live who can say that. And so Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Chair of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, for the welcome message. Uh, I'm sorry, I think there's a little bit of an error here, but it says Sir Hilary Beckles is Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. He has a distinguished career as an academic international thought leader with many reviewed essays in scholarly journals and 12 published books. Sir Hilary is also a United Nations Committee official and global public activist in the field of social justice and minority empowerment. And so I invite Sir Hilary to come and deliver his remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Honorable Prime Minister of Barbados, 
the most excellent and more motley, most honorable P.J. Patterson, former Prime Minister of Jamaica, His Excellency Patrick Robinson, Professor Vereen Shepherd, our distinguished author, all distinguished members of the Matherin family. I recognize Her Excellency Gail and all of the members of her family. My colleagues at the University of the West Indies Press, our publishers, excellencies and friends. It is perfectly normal to say at the beginning of remarks such as these, to say that it is an honor and a pleasure to participate in the event. But in this instance, which is very special indeed, I happen to be a friend of the author. I happen to be a friend of the subject of the biography Lucille Matherin Mayer, and I happen to be a friend of the publisher. So for me, it is therefore a triple treat to say these few words and to say them within the context of being an historian like our author, the subject, Lucille, and a press that is committed to bring in the history of this region to the community and to the world. When I entered the history department at the Mona campus in 1979, straight out of graduate school, Lucille had already made her mark in that history department as a graduate student, a tutor and a colleague, and had moved on to other very important activities. The author, the biographer, Vereen Shepherd, had not yet returned to that history department where she had studied as an undergraduate and of course also a postgraduate student. So what we are speaking about therefore is an ecosystem in which I had a bird's eye view. I had no way of knowing that Vereen who had moved on from her undergraduate years into a teaching profession, would return to become a great researcher in the same history department as Lucy Mayer, who did her PhD dissertation on a new and innovative subject of the experiences of women within the plantation slave based economy and society. So one distinguished and great historian who emerged became the biographer of a former colleague, Lucille, from the same discursive tradition and in the same history department, which was intellectually one of the most fertile departments in the University of, of the West Indies. Lucille and I became pretty good friends, largely initiated by an impulse 
to participate in the conversation that she had initiated. And the question she asked as a graduate student, to what extent did enslaved women experience the life of plantation enslavement in ways fundamentally different from those of men and call therefore for a gender perspective in understanding the nature of that journey through slavery and emancipation. It was of course a critical question because prior to her intervention, it was the analytical tradition to speak about enslavement in general generic terms with no specific focus upon the journey and the experiences of women in their singularity. And what she did was to unearth an entire archive that had been sitting there awaiting discovery. One of the points which she also made was that in the archives of the world, the Caribbean and the European Ar archives especially, there is more empirical evidence that focuses upon women than upon men. Women were integrated into the slavery system at multiple levels, making them visible to the narrators of the journey and hence into the record in the domestic world, in the family, the management of their fertility and the exploitation of their fertility, the laws governing slavery in which the status of slavery passed through the female line and not through the male line because only an enslaved black woman could bring a slave child into the world. The visibility of the black woman was there, the enslaved black woman was therefore greater in terms of the specifics of personality, character, role, and function than men. How then were we not aware of that all along? It is this contribution Lucille made that transformed our understanding of this history. And this is a tradition in which Vereen, becoming one of our finest and most innovative professors of Caribbean history, was able to build upon in order to generate a body of knowledge and historiography that is absolutely unique and innovative. So we are speaking therefore about author and subject within the same narrative, the same discovery and the transformation of Caribbean historiography that was to impact upon similar conversations in other parts of this hemisphere. It's hard to find therefore, it would, it would have been difficult, perhaps impossible to find an author so perfectly suited to the presentation of this biography. Professor Shepard understood the historical issues. She was able to research the journey of the subject from student, scholar, and colleague to global diplomat, global feminist thinker, 
an ideologue of social justice and global transformation, not only within the women's movement, but within the movement concerned with global social justice. In many ways, Professor Shepard has mirrored that journey in her own trajectory as a scholar, an international feminist, an international social rights and human rights pedagogue. So it is, it is a phenomenal circumstance that we are addressing in this moment. This book is therefore very rich in its content in both its empirical expression, the data, the framework, but in the nuance that captures the magnificence of this mind, this, this incredibly rich and diverse mind of Lucy Matherin Mayer. When I refer to her as, as a friend, that too is a complex construction because yes, yeah, she was friend, but she was also mentor, advisor. She was also great conversationalist. And I remember the one occasion in which she was leaving Jamaica to travel to Barbados to spend some time with her friend, Dame Nita Barrow, who was at that moment, the governor general of Barbados. And she was going down to spend some time with her friend. And the week before, she had indicated to me that this was what she was going to do and she would be in Barbados for a week or so. And I remember adjusting my itinerary. I was due to fly to Barbados before uh, that moment and I adjusted my itinerary so we could be on the same flight and we could sit together and we could talk from Kingston to Bridgetown about history, politics and all of the matters, the university and so on. Those were absolutely special moments. And to, to read in this, in this biography, the journey of a phenomenal woman, a black woman, a scholar, diplomat, one of the most respected intellectuals in the political arena of the United Nations and beyond. And to read the condensation of all of this condensed without losing fundamental essence, capturing truths, facts and patterns crystallize in the narrative of a short biography is a work of art. And I, and I wish to commend Professor Shepard for this, this work of art very few people could have accomplished this project and this mission in this skilled and sophisticated fashion. This book then is important to all of us. We thank Professor Shepard. We thank the, the family of Lucille Matherin Mayer. We thank the University Press for making this, this all happen. This project is a celebration of the life of a great sister, mother, colleague, comrade, presented to us by another woman who represents those same characteristics. Great colleague, great friend, phenomenal intellect, ambassador, global contributor to the world we prefer to dwell in, a world of fairness and justice. And so I end where I began. It's a privilege and a pleasure because I am a friend of the author, great friend 
of the subject and friend of the publisher. Thank you. very much sir hillary for that very insightful presentation and those remarks i think we were all transported just now mentally you know just imagining puff as an undergraduate <laughs> and personally you know for me as a caribbean history student uh, and looking through mentally all those books beckles and shepherd it was a journey indeed. And some major points were made there, particularly the one about the contribution of Lucille Matherin Mayer as a, as a black woman in her time and just her concern beyond her own understanding and development to the broader outlook to students, to the country, to service at the highest level. You know, it is just something to think about. And also talking about the series and how I think the UE has, UE Press has developed a template. I, I have to talk to the editors. But the thing I really love about all of these biographies is that it really is an art in terms of how they have managed to condense what are the, the lives and work of people who have made significant contribution and make it so accessible. And I think it's a gift particularly to the current generation. And so at this point in the program, I am going to, well, we're gonna ask that the recorded contribution from Cabo uh, on the program be played, but I'm going to read Cabo's um, biography first. And it says that Kabu it uses poetry as a crucial tool in realizing her purpose to speak truth to power. She has published three anthologies. She's an innovative international broadcast journalist, activist for social justice and media consultant with over 30 years of progressive experience in the media and communication industry. She's the host of the popular Sunday program, Morning Program, and Pan-African news magazine called the Africa Forum, or popularly, more popularly known as Running African, which is um, carried on Ari FM. And so at this point, I'm going to ask that the special item be played. Thank you very much. I'm reading from my book, Making Kenke from Memory, A Sun Carpic Journey. And the poem is a prayer song for Mama Enid. She wasn't ready for the revolution, but stepped into view to protect her man, forgotten woman, mattress in hand. Remove the springs from the old palias, a fracture in the mind, a splintering malleus. If she had a hammer, she'd rally us like Buster rallied from Arnett to Bogue, remember? What Barnet Street couldn't hold, Bogue would. Wartime woman wrapped in drogue find ways out of unruly graveyards. Carried him there, though pained and scarred. Or wrapped this silent cot around imperial beard. Secretly soldiering ancestral mausoleums, jeered. Pregnant soaring midst hometown cares. She held his pride delicately. Wolf salt a monumentum of an old crucifixion. Barnet Street is a walled necropolis in Easter. There grave diggers in uniforms disremember coral gardens, a potter's field forsaken. She held his pride softly. He was her kingman. To prostrate is the humiliating affliction. The mattress must always upright stand. 
Tears like sepulchres do not crystallize. They look higher to cover maternal fears, for seen is still in fetal pain now etherocise. Incubated spaces, sanctum, sanctorium, vasta tectum, priest of the tabernacle. Buster had no business in her bedroom. In the Holy of Holies, empty sepulchre. She carries mattresses in vitro, wrote his name on steely incubator, seared in time. Buster was the inquisitor. Doorkeepers, there will be a reckoning. Sisters in Durbar's their kingman palanquin. Buster had no business in her bedchamber. His mattress is sarcophagus, remember? Her speech ancestral obelisks recreating, told her stories in cartouches for centuries. Her own people of Punic faith, false memories, the bed in votive offering keeps him alive. She held his pride gently. He must survive. He need to derange her long suffering. Mother God from the Holy Triad excluded. Naya Bingi wartime woman is wounded, dead or alive in the second scourging. Good Friday is Rasta's disemboweling. The evening and the morning was a second day. She held his pride tenderly, so as not to sway the child she carried on Holy Thursday. She knew placentation tribulation on the Lord's day. Penitent excruciation, warrior-like in solitary inquisition. He will be reborn or yet entombed. Any art and any art, fire soul. Any art and any art, water soul. Magdalene of the cross, sevenfold. She told her story in royal cartouche wrote painful memories and all she touched. He was her king man's son's moustache. There was nothing good about that Friday. Give us Barabbas, make him pray for hailing Rastafari. They must pay, Good Friday, crucifixion hour. Bill wombs of matresses ex vivo. The executioner is national hero. Vipress Buster must face the reckoning, ectogenesis in the rebirthing. She held his pride tenderly in the blackness, wrapped him softly in upright mattress, kept watch like Enid Gerange in practice. The morning and the evening was the third day. Resurrection came slowly, Easter Sunday. King man rebirthing from Kaya tomb. Enid must touch him, he's seen the father. Searches his soul for the man they slaughtered. He's not there for he's risen. A drink of water. This is how she stitched back the mattress. One spring at a time till Buster is dead. Counting needle points silently in her head. If they don't pay. He held her body closely. She was his queen. From the bowels of Kaya, justice for seen. In time, they will march for repatriation, like warriors demand full reparations. Mm -hmm. And so at this point in the program, we are, well, we have a very special address, the keynote actually, that will be delivered by Honorable Mayor Amor Motley. Before I allow her to join us, um, she's actually joining us live, which is very special, I believe, uh, at this time when we know our heads of government have so much <laughs> to contemplate with. I think that's very special for her to be joining us for the launch. So to introduce um, PM Motley, it says, the Honorable Mia Motley is the eighth prime minister of Barbados. She became the first woman to occupy the high office following general elections on May 24th, 2018. 
in which she led the Barbados Labour Party to an emphatic victory, winning all 30 seats in the House of Assembly by the largest margin ever seen in the electoral history of the country. An attorney at law and Queen's Counsel, PM Motley has been active in the political life of Barbados for almost three decades. She doesn't look it though. First elected in 1994, she is presently serving her sixth ter term as member of parliament for the constituency of St. Michael Northeast. Between 1994 and 2008, Mayor Motley served in the cabinet of three successive administrations, first as a minister of education and culture, then as attorney general and minister of home affairs, and then as minister of economic affairs. In 2003, she was appointed deputy prime minister. Pia Motley currently holds the portfolios of Minister of Finance, Economic Affairs, and Investment. Since becoming Prime Minister, Mayor Motley has served as the chair of the Conference of Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community between January 1st and June 30th, 2020. Notwithstanding that, Ms. Motley, as PM of Barbados, serves as the lead head of government within CARICOM, bearing responsibility for CARICOM single market and economy. Prime Minister Motley also serves as co-chair of the America's Cruise Tourism Task Force for the Caribbean, Mexico, Central and South America markets. PM Motley is also co-chair of the Development Committee of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund uh, from November 2020 to October 2021. And finally, PM Motley is also co-chair of the World Health Organization's Global Leaders Group on Antimicrobial Resistance. And in that last role in particular, <laughs> we thank her for her work and now invite PM Motley to join us to deliver the remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I am truly happy to be here this afternoon. I wish I was in Jamaica with you, um, but that's for another time and another space. And you will ask, did I know Lucille Matherin Mayor well? No, I didn't. But the notion and the idea of this woman always loomed large in my life as a child growing up and as a young professional and politician in the Caribbean. And I therefore claim the right to be here for three reasons. One, because without Lucille Matherin Mayor, there wouldn't be many of us women in the Caribbean today claiming our positions in the areas of activity in the public space that we are doing. She was one of those Caribbean trailblazers that made a huge difference and that literally paved the way for the rest of us to be here. Secondly, you must know that if you've read the biography, that her ancestry is as much Bajan as it is Jamaican. And therefore, as Prime Minister of Barbados, I claim the right to be able to claim her as one of those persons of whom we are very proud, as I'm sure her very good friend, were she alive, Damita Barrow, would have instructed me so to do. And thirdly, because of her daughter, um, Ambassador Gail Matherin, who heads up for the region, the Office of Trade Negotiations, and who has been a distinguished diplomat on behalf of her own country, but also on behalf of the Caribbean community. And as we say in Barbados, a pear don't fall from an apple tree. So that if you know Gail, you know then her mother in a very real sense, and all that they have stood for fighting in this Caribbean civilization. And, and why am I particularly happy to be here? I just spent the last few hours in a lecture, conversation rather, with Professor Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University, well known globally as an economist who has brought a moral perspective and a sense of fairness to the discussions um, on the world in which we live today. And in a very real sense, much of our discussion as we discuss the future of sustainable um, development for small islands is really fundamentally about do they see us and are they prepared to be fair with us and those two themes resonate with me because even as i picked up the book and started to go through my notes in it again 
I stop at the statement at page 74. Throughout her career, she consistently supported the maxim, nothing about us without us. And I quote it again, nothing about us without us. And what really has been the journey of Lucille Matherin Mayer as a person schooled in the art of history, but determined to tell our story as a Caribbean woman. And that commitment was not simply to tell our story as defined by the hour of the time that she lived in. And I refer both to H-O-U-R and O-U-R because the time in which she lived regrettably did not see women. And our story for her was both therefore the story of Caribbean people, but most importantly, the story of Jamaican women, the historical study of women in Jamaica, 1655 to 1844. It would have taken extraordinary courage and commitment and determination for her to determine that that story needed to be told, that the hour had come for us to recognize that the women who literally worked throughout this region and helped to build this region from as far back as the 17th century needed to have their story told. And regrettably, it is something that we continue to fight up against because after 1844, Caribbean women and Jamaican women continue to play a fundamental role in both the resistance that was needed to be able to protect our lives and our dignity, but equally in the advancing through the platforms necessary to keep families together, to keep children learning, to be able to keep communities together. And the fact that that story still had not been told during the course of her life and that she made this seminal contribution completed thereafter because of her passing by um, Sir Hillary and others is a significant statement of the world in which we live. When I went to Geneva two years ago to do the Raoul Prebish lecture, the theme of it was that we regrettably remained invisible for too many and we suspect dispensable. And that story that I told of Caribbean nations may well have been the story that Lucille Matherin Mayer was telling of women in the Caribbean. That in spite of the fact that we were the ones holding children together, holding families together, holding communities together, in spite of that fact, that even today, regrettably, the contribution of women is still not being sufficiently counted in our society in order to be able to make that difference. And uh, uh, how do I know? COVID has hit us where it has hurt the most. And we have had in our own society to make determinations that without people playing critical roles, there can be no safe economic activity or no safe social activity. And one of those roles relates to how children relate to each other, whether in the household or whether in schools, and who is it that is there next to these children trying to keep them together over the course of the last 16 months when normal school activity has been impossible for us to undertake? It has been our women in our society. It has been the women in Barbados who have become the primary school monitors, who have literally been put there to ensure that children could go back into primary schools and still function within the context of the pandemic. Who is it? that we've also put out there in order to be able to ensure that we can take care of our elders. More often than not, it is our women and for whom there has been very, very little reflection of gratitude or payment over the course of the decades or centuries for those people who have to play that role so that others can go to work and earn. And all of these things are simply taken for granted, largely because conversations are had without us. And that is why the statement, nothing about us without us means so much to me today. Because whether we're talking about our countries and the global community within which we function, whether across the United Nations institutions, whether it is with the Bretton Woods institutions, we've just come out of the meeting today, 
calling for the need for a new conversation for reform of the Bretton Woods institutions. Why? Because they were formed at a time where they set rules and set a mission that did not necessarily reflect the perspective of small states and does not now give us an opportunity to show why small states need that change in the international financial architecture if we are to move forward. But then again, there was nothing about us that um, was written because we were not there at the time in 1944 and 45 when the discussions were taking place in New Hampshire to craft out the institutions that would govern the world in terms of its financial dealings. Similarly today, in our, our own countries, we see that take place not just with women, but with other marginalized groups. And I simply want to therefore salute her courage for being able to put forward a number of theses and moral positions that make all the difference in the world in which we live today. When you hear me talk about global moral strategic leadership, it is because these values are universal and these are the values that have made sure that we have been able to move out of the bowels of tyranny and exploitation to where we are, recognizing that we have not yet reached the point which we want to get in terms of destination, but that we are still very much, my friends, along the way, but we have come a long way from there where we were. These values that reflect respect and reflect inclusion are therefore absolutely critical to the battle that she would have fought. But what is the difference? I say so today with almost a great level of ease because I come four decades later after Lucille Matherin Mayer became the first woman ever to become an Under Secretary General of the United Nations. The fact that she could make that journey as a Black Caribbean woman is something of which we will always be proud because she went where no other woman had gone globally. By the same token, it could not have been easy for her to be able to fight the battles. And what stood out for me is the position that she took with respect to Palestine and Israel as she did her work before leaving the post of Under Secretary General. It is regrettable and, and perhaps to give you context of what it is she was fighting up against. It is regrettable that today in this world, in this year, 2021, that problem with the Palestinians and the Israelis still remains as intractable today as it was a few decades ago. But we recognize that great battles are not won overnight. And her efforts to be able to put forward the role of women and to call for a place at the table to use the language of Shirley Chisholm, even if it meant bringing your own folding chair to the table, that is really what has inspired so many of us and has made our life that much easier because she existed at a time where it was unheard of for women to be at the table. And therefore, in the affairs of global international politics, that she was able to do so with the different great conferences that were called by the United Nations to celebrate the contribution of women, but equally to call for additional rights for women. These things are all for us something of which we're not only proud, but we are conscious that we stand on her shoulders in being able to continue to advance those battles. There are some that will argue that the battles may have been won with respect to some elements of gender, but they continue still in other forms as we go on. And we know it all to be true because you don't change millennia of behavior and attitudes in a decade or a few years. And to that extent, therefore, we welcome the opportunity to take up the baton and to continue the efforts. Of course, there are others along the way like Peggy Antrobus and Jocelyn Messiah who continued. And of course, at this university, um, Professor Barato, who um, is, is, is principal at Cave Hill, all of them would have continued the great work that Lucille Matherin Mayer would have started. But even they are not in a position to say mission accomplished yet. Because as I said, what we're trying to do is to reverse attitudes that became entrenched for millennia. It is against that background 
that when you place context, you begin to see how truly extraordinary this lady was as a Caribbean freedom fighter. Freedom, not in the traditional sense that we know it, but freedom for us as women in our sense, because it meant that she was seeking to liberate the rights of women to be who they want to be, to express themselves as they need to express themselves and to create opportunities that hitherto did not exist. I want to salute the University of the West Indies and their press for this Caribbean biography series. But I really do feel, Sir Hillary and Professor Shepard, that we need to move to the next level. And I'm conscious that I've said over and over that Caribbean people regrettably are not reading enough. I hope that this will inspire many to read. I hope that this will be used as a text within the university and within our secondary schools, um, because I think it is clear enough and concise enough for in that young Caribbean students, young Caribbean women ought to be reading um, about Lucille Mather and Mayor from an early age so that they are inspired to believe that they too can do great things and they too can be trailblazers. But in addition to the books, as I speak to you from the Arabaro Center of Creative Imagination, it would be inappropriate for me to ignore the fact that the reality of this third decade of the 21st century is predominantly audiovisual and that we must now embrace the obligation of being able to put into movies or into um, audiovisual programming the lives of these great Caribbean titans. Because I really, really feel that it should not be restricted to university students or secondary school students. But I feel that in the same way American primary school students learn about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and their great heroes, then we in the Caribbean ought to be teaching our kids in primary school about our great heroes. And whether those are the traditional heroes that came across as warriors like Nanny Grigg or Bussa, or whether those are the nation builders like those who came across, like um, Sir Grant Lee Herbert Adams and Eric Williams and Norman Washington Manley, or whether they are those who are the trailblazers in areas that history and our societies were not tracking and recording like the advance of women's rights, then I feel those stories have to be told. And I hope that this event today will inspire those of us who have that duty to teach our people. And that I may, I say that not just as formal teachers and tutors within the formal education system, but all of the rest of us who non-formally have a responsibility to pass on knowledge to our people. I say so conscious that I hope that that audiovisual expression of this work and of the other works in the Caribbean biography series will do wonders to be able to keep their story alive. You know, more than ever, this region has a story to tell. But our story to tell is not just about movements or, or values. It's a story ultimately about people because it is people who reflected those values and it is people who constituted those movements. And these are the same people, therefore, that we have written about in the Caribbean biography series. These are the same people that we want to teach you about. And at the end of it all, as we teach our young people and others about them, I would only hope that they too will realize how much has been done before they came and how much they need to be grateful for, for those who literally, literally open new opportunities that hitherto did not exist in this very, very modern and recent civilization of ours. It is significant, Doreen, that the last words in this book was to a woman who is also my family and for whom I have great respect, Peggy Antrobus. And that simple question to me reflects also the humility of the woman of whom we speak today. And it was simply, Peggy, you mean I did all that? Well, we knew she did all that and more because I'm sure that wherever she is today looking down, she would be appreciative 
that it is not just her generation that she impacted upon, but the subsequent generations of Caribbean women who hold her up as an icon today and who understand that without you, there would be no us in this dynamic. Yes, women would be here, obviously, but the ability to walk the corridors of power, the ability to have and take and claim the opportunity to make decisions about ourselves was rooted in the simple beliefs that you reflected in your life. Nothing about us without us. If that simple theme is kept, then we will go so much further as a region, so much further as a Caribbean civilization, but most appropriately for today, so much further as Caribbean women. I hope and pray that we can find ways of taking the expression of what she has done to be able to have the conversations that are relevant to the 21st century in which we live, to be able to allow women to know how to say no rather than being forced to believe that they may, must say yes simply to access power, wealth, or space. Because this battle that she fought was fundamentally about giving women choice and dignity. And if we do nothing else, we need to understand how do we in the third decade of the 21st century say to our young women, say to our older women who may be floundering under the COVID-19 and all of the economic pressures that have come with it, say to each of them, from whether old, young, rich, or poor perspective, how is it that we can provide that dignity and respect for Caribbean women, recognizing that people who make mock sport at us or people who feel that it is appropriate just to joke and to think, which is cool for some who want to have a laugh, but at the end of the day, does it uplift and empower and enable young girls and young women in this region to play the full role that they can play while at the same time not allowing them to go through the horrors and the emotional turmoil that very often too many of our young women are first forced to go through largely because of a failure of persons to respect them and to create space for them. I hope that the conversations that we're having as it relates not just to equality of opportunity but also to the protection of our women against the kinds of abuse be it verbal abuse or physical abuse, that these can become mainstream. Because it is only when we begin to have the difficult conversations in this region that we're going to see the progress that we so urgently need. In the name and space of Lucille Matherin Mayor, I claim that space today as a space where we must continue to advance progress on behalf of those young girls who are yet to come, who must know that people before them fought to make an easier and better way for them so that they could sleep easier at night. And that they, on realizing that, must equally seek to pay forward to make a better way for those girls who are yet to come. I hope that this book therefore gives us great inspiration and that will ensure that there are some who are listening today or who will learn from this book and who will understand that they too have a role to play in the passing of the baton or the carrying of the baton, I should say, um, in this battle for Caribbean women and Caribbean women's rights. Thank you and God bless. Brilliant style, uh, lots to take away there. And we look forward to welcoming her to Jamaica when she can visit. I know that Jamaica on Twitter in particular, who calls her Antonia, <laughs> will warmly welcome um, the PM. But much to take away there, particularly nothing about us without us. That's such a powerful call to action and a good segue to, to introduce our next speaker, who, well, a fun fact about today's program is that there are actually four Wilmerians participating. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it's all about you, but I have to go in there myself. So that's me. And of course, Lucille Matherin Mayer, who is a member of the Wilmer's Hall of Fame. Her daughter, Gail, um, if I have the information correctly, and Dr. Delia Bean. <laughs> and so 
before introducing Bela with her bio, I would say that I'm giving us as, as old girls a call to action to ensure that we get copies of this book into the hands of students and recommend it, that it be actively um, introduced in terms of the teaching so that beyond just having her name in the Hall of Fame, that Wilmerians understand the legacy that she left behind and, and are inspired as PM Motley outlined to do more, achieve more and to build on the legacy. And so in introducing Dahlia, she's the lecturer and graduate coordinator at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Regional Coordinating Office at the University of the West Indies. She has researched extensively in the areas of women and gender justice in Caribbean history, women in conflict situations and gender relations in the Caribbean hotel industry. Her, single, her first single authored book, Jamaican Women and the World Wars, on the Front Lines of Change was published in 2017 by Paul Grave Macmillan. She was also commissioned by the RJ Aguina Communications Group to write Jamaican Women of Distinction, Holding Up Half the Sky in 2020. Her contribution to the region's education was also bolstered by her appointment as the Assistant Chief Examiner of CSEC History. And I think that's a great achievement, Delia. And so I'm going to invite you to come and to deliver your remarks and to officially launch the book. Thank you so much for that very kind welcome, Chair Mrs. Latoya West Blackwood. Honorable Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados. Most Honorable PJ Patterson, former Prime Minister of Jamaica. Our Vice Chancellor, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. His Excellency, Judge Patrick Robinson. Ambassador Gail Matherin and other family members of Ambassador Mayor, Professor Vereen Shepherd. Distinguished guests all, good afternoon. It is with a great sense of gratitude and amazement that I undertake the task of launching this stellar biography of an international citizen, Caribbean stalwart, and Jamaican woman of remarkable accomplishment written by an international citizen, Caribbean stalwart, and Jamaican woman of remarkable accomplishment. While gratitude is an overwhelming emotion for me today, amazement at having been asked is also lingering in the deep processes of my mind. Anyone who knows Professor Vereen Shepherd knows that she is a paragon of professionalism, deeply thoughtful, and rarely makes a faux pas. So I believe that she must be justified in asking me to launch her most recent book. Since I've always trusted her judgment from the days of her supervising my PhD to being one of the directors under which I served at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, I swiftly said yes when she invited me to launch this important biography. As the task dawned, however, I realized that while I had been to countless book launches, I had never launched one myself. So I turned to the expert. As fate would have it, Professor Shepard launched my first book, as you would have heard the title before, on Jamaican women and the world wars. In the pre-COVID-19 world, that was November 2018. I quickly reached for this valuable resource, thanks to my father who had the video on hand, and I listened to her eloquently and scholastically launch my book. And so now I feel sufficiently equipped to, as we say in Jamaica, try a thing. So Prof, you are vicariously launching your own book, so I know it will go well. In all seriousness though, 
jumping head first into something that one has never done before could easy, easily have been the title of this amazing book around which we gather today. Ambassador Lucille Matherin Mayer is a definition of a trailblazer. She excavated new territory at every twist and turn of her life. If anyone wants a dose of confidence to launch into the deep, they should be prescribed this book, which exquisitely unearths Mayer's greatness. This greatness is not only as a result of her numerous accomplishments, but simply because of who she was, a woman of grit, intellect, and charm who never met a roadblock that had no choice but to cave under her steely disposition. In many ways, we are not only here today because of her and this book, but I say without fear of contradiction that many of us have reached where we are in life through either the direct or indirect influence of Ambassador Mayer on our personal, professional, and academic lives. I know I have. The first major history project I worked on as a graduate student in the Department of History at the UE Mona was with Professor Sir Hilary Beckles and Professor Shepard, who co-edited Mayer's PhD thesis titled A Historical Study of Women in Jamaica, 1655 to 1844. This was published in 2006 by the UE Press. Assisting on this labor of love was sweetly difficult and rewarding work that gave me a peek into the rigors of historical scholarship and further convinced me that I yearned to be a gender historian. As you would have heard, I'm quite tickled that she and I went to the same high school, Wilma's High for Girls. And I'm also a proud member of faculty of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, which she was instrumental in establishing and where she served as our first regional coordinator. See, as I said before, Prof. Shepard rarely makes mistakes. I am here because of Mayor. Ambassador Mayor, thank you. The book, Lucille Matherin Mayor, part of the UE Press, Collection, um, Press Caribbean Biography Series, is a triumph. The richness of its content outshines its very teeny tiny pocket size. This 88 page book expands as you read it in beautiful and unexpected ways, resembling a majestic peacock's plumage. I must congratulate Prof. Shepard and the research team for the delicate and provocative way in which it is written. As one of the most prolific history scholars of the region, Prof. Shepard's style has evolved over the years, but I actually don't remember reading anything like this from her. It effectively borrows from the literary stylings of a best-selling novel, within which is ensconced the abundance of rig rigorous archival research. The reader is taken on a journey, which is difficult to pause. I myself read it in about one afternoon. The reader, if, sorry, even if you are acquainted with the life of Ambassador Mayer, you will read this book on the edge of your seat thinking, what happens next? The plot includes a vibrant pro protagonist, vivid historical characters, romance, tragedy, survival, all brimming with enough tension and release to make the work as much a pleasure to read as it is a crucible of critical content. Through these pages, you will meet, or in some cases be reacquainted with the multifaceted icon that is Ambassador Mayer. As Shepard explained, her multiple roles spanned professional historian, wife, mother, diplomat, national and international civil servant, legislator, and women's rights activist. Importantly, this book contextualizes Mayor's passion for women's rights, as we would have heard from Prime Minister Motley, in so many ways. Her role as a teacher to young women at St. Joseph Content School in St. Lucia, warden of the first all-female hall at the Urimona, Mary C. Cole Hall, and the first person to do a PhD on women at the Uimona were seemingly divinely ordained to lead her along the path 
of an at first reluctant feminist and staunch women's rights activist. Her Michael Manley Commission study on the conditions of women in the early 1970s eventually resulted in the formation of a women's bureau, now the Bureau of Gender Affairs, then headed by her friend and colleague, Grenadian-born feminist activist, Peggy Antrobus. Mayer was part of the army of rebel women, including Jocelyn Masayo, Elsa Leo Riney, and others that birthed the institu institutionalization of women and development education at the UE, resulting in the current Institute for Deve Gender and Development Studies. Fortunately, after almost 30 years later, there still exists leadership such as our VC at the UE, which remains committed to the importance of such an institute. Though at times, the underground microaggressions against staff and students of the IGDS still leave us channeling our inner mayor to stand firm in what she called one of the most challenging, dynamic, and rich areas of research and scholarship in the region. I do believe that the hardworking and Talawa staff of the four regional units of the IGDS should consider ourselves blessed to continue in her footsteps as we at times have to justify the existence of the IGDS with grace, fervor, and style. It is also her gender work that gave Jamaica its first and so far only female heroine, Nanny of the Maroons. It is a shame that she is no longer with us to continue the work necessary to include others to the role such as poet Louise Bennett. But I believe that enough persons have benefited from the heritage of her tenacity to transform the unlikely into the inevitable. We must continue to fulfill the promise of her past. Her gender journey is certainly fascinating, but what is even more enticing about the book for me is the way in which Mayer's professional life is interwoven with her personal joys and sorrows as a daughter, sister, wife, widow, mother, and more. Mayer is unequivocally presented as a relatable person. One can feel her pain as she's left to support three young children after the passing of her first husband, Guy Matherin. One also smiles as stories are told of her careful mothering of these three amazing children, Ambassador Gail, David, and Adrian Matherin. One yearns with her as she attempted to assuage a distant relationship with her father. One is tempted to ride along with her as she bobbed and weaved through the traffic and confusion of the Walter Rodney protest in 1968 to collect her daughter from school. And one watches in wonder as she later opened her home as a refuge to Rodney's then pregnant wife, Patricia, in the midst of the violent drama on the streets and ideolo ideological drama in political circles. This biography is gritty, stimulating, and authentic. Another consistent theme in the book is her centrality among other Caribbean greats and her existence at the vanguard of watershed moments in history. She was party to discussions relating to Jamaican independence from Britain as an adolescent. She lived through World War II, the Black Power Movement, and the militant 70s, which shaped a unique Caribbean consciousness. We learn from these pages of this book that she debated issues of Caribbean identity with future Caribbean leaders, such, such as Errol Barrow, first Prime Minister of Barbados, and Forbes Burnham, first Prime Minister of Guyana. She shared a flat with Michael Manley, future Prime Minister of Jamaica, and his first wife, Jacqueline Ramillard. She was a matron of honor at the wedding, of the first wedding of St. Lucia, St. Lucia Nobel laureate to be, Derek Walcott. Former Prime Minister of Jamaica, PJ Patterson interacted with her when he was student chairman of Chancellor Hall at the UE Mono. It seems like anyone who would be anyone in, Car in Caribbean history was at some point touched by this angel. This book also takes us through the details of Mayor's call to diplomatic service 
at the United Nations and as Jamaica's ambassador to Cuba. In addition to her passion and attention to women's rights, Ambassador Mayer also became an astute negotiator and an expert at massaging results out of geopolitical tensions, first in Cuba, and then as we would have heard, as the Secretary General of the UN International Conference on the question of Palestine. It is this latter role that saw her not only having to deal with violent threats to her person, but as the first female under Secretary General at the UN, she carried the weight of the world's skepticism of women as leaders. There is so much more I could say, but of course I would like you to buy the book. So I'll start applying the breaks here. The only other thing I will say is that this book is more than a biography. It is a carefully curated resource which answers key questions such as, how have Caribbean women and men utilized their inimitable Caribbeanness to influence global phenomena? Or how have issues of women and gender intersected with critical questions of development, justice, and security? Or even how do powerful women convince powerful men to join as allies to do the right thing for peace and for progress? Importantly, the work allows Ambassador Mayer to answer such questions in her own words, reviving her voice and her vision for the Caribbean and the world and educating younger generations about her playbook on how to boldly go where no one has gone before and live to tell the tale, or at least have it expertly written for you. Towards the end of her life, Mayor's failing health left her with very few memories of the ways in which everything she touched turned to gold. As you would have heard from Prime Minister Motley, Shepard ends with a touching reminder of the juxtaposition of the difference one life can make and the fragility of life itself by recounting a story that Peggy Antrobus tells us about one of her last encounters with Mayor. She recalls, that before Mayor's condition worsened, they would engage in conversation about their work. And Mayor looked at her and said, Peggy, you mean I did all that? Each day Ambassador Mayor lived was put to exceptional use. No aspect of her journey was wasted. And so in this spirit of carpe diem, I humbly declare this work launched with a simple answer to Mayor's own question, yes. You did all that and so much more, and the best is yet to come. Thank you. very very well done launch and so in your remarks you your remarks actually also served as a call to action in thinking through some of the things that were were mentioned but one of the things that stood out to me was commenting on the style um of puffs it, it actually is different from me as well <laughs> reading from, from Prof um, in terms of the style. And I think that that's one of the things that makes it accessible as well to a new generation. Just the whole matter of we celebrate people sometimes around their titles and accomplishments, but not the human side as well, telling that story. And I think it's a very good balance that has been achieved in this work. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the author and the researcher's response. And I am going to be introducing first author and historian, Professor Shepard, Maureen Shepard. I think I can close my eyes and introduce her. <laughs> but, I, but one of the things that I, I have to say at this point, it's off script, 
is that I'm big on authenticity and what makes me very honored, I think that was used by um, Hilary Beckles earlier, Sir Beckles, in terms of talking about the word honored, I really do feel honored to be participating in the program today. You are an authentic mentor and supporter of women, particularly young women. I've benefited from that. Your goddaughters who are watching are very proud of you <laughs> and applauding and reading the book as well. And so I think that in selecting the UE Press must be commended on the care which has been taken in selecting the authors of these works. I think that that has really lifted as well the impact of the, the work in terms of how well suited the authors are in terms of telling these stories. And so formally introducing <laughs> Professor Shepard, Professor Varim Shepard, a Jamaican born in St. Mary, and she tells, she, she announces that a lot. She's very proud of her parish, is a social historian and current director of the Center for Reparation Research at the University of the West Indies. She holds a BA and MPhil degrees in history from the University of the West Indies Mono campus and a PhD from the University of Cambridge. She researches Jamaican economic history uh, slavery, reparation, and gender discourses in Caribbean history. Prof. Shepard is host of Talking History on Nationwide 90 FM, a member of the National Council on Reparation, Jamaica, a vice chair of the CARICOM Reparation Commission, and a vice chair of the United Nations Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And there is so much more that we can say, but at this point, <laughs> I will welcome you, Prof. Thank you very much, Latoya, for that kind introduction and for that moment of silence for Dr. Joseph Powell. Uh, thank you so much for having started that way. Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Honorable Mayor Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, Most Honorable PJ Patterson, former Prime Minister of Jamaica, and a statesman in residence at the P.J. Patterson Center for Africa Caribbean Advocacy at the University of the West Indies. His Excellency Patrick Robinson, Judge of the International Court of Justice at The Hague, who I know is watching today. Members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of Lucille Matherin Mayer's family, Ambassador Gail Matherin, David, who is here with us. Hi, David, thank you so much for being here. Adrian, <laughs> Adrian, who is watching and Jeanette Campbell, uh, who is here. Fellow participants on this program, Stephanie Sewell, Nadine Buckland, Delia Bean, and Kabu Maad Keru. Members of the University of the West Indies' press management team and board of directors, staff of the regional headquarters of the UWI, members of the book launch organizing team, members of the media, members of my family, Distinguished guests all, thank you all for joining me in this moment of celebration of the life and work of this phenomenal woman, Lucille Matherin Mayer, as presented in this biography. I also ask you to join me in wishing the late Ambassador Lucille Matherin Mayer a happy birthday. She was born on June 21, 1924, and would have been 97 today. So can we give a big shout out to Lucille? Absolutely. Now, no matter how many books an author has written, each book like each book launch is special. This one is extra special because my mentor, Vice Chancellor Beckles participated the phenomenal Prime Minister of Barbados, Honorable Mayor Motley, participated. Members of Ambassador Lucille Matherin Mayor's family are present. And four young women, Latoya, Stephanie, Cabo, and Dahlia, 
who have either been my students, research assistants, or simply sister friends and co-conspirators in chanting down Babylon participated. I'm especially proud that my former PhD student, Dr. Delia Bean, who is now a historian and author in her own right, did me the honor of launching the book. Her insightful analysis of the work and her familiarity with Lucille Matherin Mayer's own trajectory demonstrate that she understands where history and gender discourses stand at the crossroads of memory studies and the project of iconic reclamation. I have to admit that I was absolutely delighted when I was asked by the University of the West Indies Press to participate in this Caribbean biography series by writing this biography of Lucille Matherin Mayer, about whom so much has already been said. Indeed, it is a signal honor for me to write about a woman who over the course of her life embraced the multiple roles of professional historian, wife, mother, mentor, diplomat, national and international civil servant, legislator and women's rights activist. A woman who through her scholar activism successfully embodied and promoted the principles of justice and equality for women, especially women of the global south and someone recognized internationally for her activism in the struggle against all forms of discrimination and for the cause of peace and disarmament. Through interviews with her family, her friends and colleagues, as well as research of her archives, the true measure of this marvelous woman who served with such distinction at the national, regional, and international levels has been revealed and made accessible to a wider audience. This biography tells only part of a larger story. We had a word limit, <laughs> and we had to stick to that. But it's part of that larger story that others will no doubt complete eventually, because we have many more of our papers to go through, by the way. The decision to include Lucille Matherin Mayer in the biography series was a very wise one especially in light of her pivotal role in the journey to institutionalize gender studies at the UWI. It is no wonder that she was named among the 70 plus outstanding women in the 70th year of existence of the UWI. Lucille Matherin Mayer was a true citizen of the world, not just of the Caribbean where she was born, where she grew up and lived most of her life. Dr. Bean and all who spoke before me have captured the es essence of this phenomenal woman. And I hope others who have read or will later buy and read the biography will share the perspectives that have been presented. Matherin Mayer's body of work allows us to understand resistance and decolonizing politics and the role of the historian in shaping collective memory. Even though she loomed and still looms large in the academy and is recognized globally, as a pioneer of Caribbean women's history, this stature did not stop her from asking for advice when other historians like Barry Higman um, was asked to give her detailed comments on her thesis. She reached out, didn't stop her from asking for advice from other historians. And in fact, we found out later, as Stephanie remembers, uh, we found some notes from Barry um, as we were looking through the notes to write this biography, because Stephanie has helped me so much, we found some yellow papers with some notes about how, if she had time, she would have restructured the book. And VC, I have to admit that we, we did good because we didn't depart too much from the suggestions that were being given. And she also, you know, whether male or female, ad expressed her admiration for others in the field of women's history. VC, at a Black History Month event in Jamaica, she said this, and I quote from her letter. Well, it was a speech really she was giving. A recent publication on the heroism of Barbadian enslaved women, natural rebels by Hilary Beckles, published in 1989, should be on the shelf of all those who pay tribute to Black women in Black History Month. The fact that Hilary Beckles of the University of the West Indies and one of the region's most outstanding historians happens to be a man is quite irrelevant. <laughs> but VC, the letter from the advertising and publicity manager at Rutgers University Press that accompanied the copy of the book you had previously asked to be sent to Lucille read, 
and I quote again, dear Dr. Mayer, here Rebecca suggested that we send you a copy of her book, Natural Rebels, a social history of enslaved black women in Barbados, just published by Rutgers University Press. The book is enclosed with her compliments as well as ours. Please feel free to promote her book to friends, journals, and relevant media through her. Cordially, Kay Murray. Lucille was gracious in her acknowledgement and subtle in her correction in her February 27, 1990 letter to Miss Murray. Dear Miss Murray, this is to acknowledge with deep appreciation receipt of Natural Rebels, a social history of enslaved black women in Barbados by my good friend and colleague, Hilary Beckles. His research and publications are making a major contribution to Caribbean scholarship on slavery. And this new work of his is another significant landmark, which I shall be happy to promote. Thank you again. Yours sincerely, Lucille Mayer, Senator, Minister of State. Ambassador Lucille Matril Mayer had other admirable qualities. She believed firmly in paying tribute to mentors and influencers, some of whom are tuned in today. In a 1996 speech, she said, and I quote, there are stages in your life when you have to pay tribute to those who, in offering guidance, inspiration, and encouragement, made things possible for you. She numbered among those who provided inspiration, the enslaved women ancestors she met in the dusty archives, where she tried to, in her words, decode the mysteries of the black female condition. But by her own admission, wonderful things happened on the journey into that female rebel past, for no one could spend so many years in the company of such women and remain the same. One of those wonderful things was a commitment to ensure that she popularized the rationale for the courage displayed by the activist woman, Nanny, whose experiences she uncovered. And then she said, when we are tempted to ask, where on earth did such women like Nanny and others, the so-called subordinate sex, get the nerve to confront systems of domination, we should know that it came from their very subordination, the moral force of the powerless confronting the powerful and from their ability to draw strength from the inheritance of ancestral spirits from that other side of the ocean. May we all draw lessons and inspiration from her life. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shepard. I'm sure all of us drew a lot of inspiration from your address just now, telling us the story behind the book and you know your own inspiration for completing the work. And importantly, I believe, is the partnership between yourself and our next speaker, Stephanie. You know, in terms of just the whole, this book feels very special in, in so many ways. The launch, the work itself, having an established historian, mentoring another young woman. It, it really, I don't know about anybody else, but I really do feel a particular energy with this publication and the launch. And so at this point, I'm going to invite Ms. Stephanie Sewell to come and, and address us as the research assistant for this publication. Before Stephanie comes, I'll introduce her. Stephanie is currently the research officer assigned to the Jamaica Education Com Transformation Commission. Prior to this appointment, she worked as a researcher at the Caribbean Policy Research Institute and the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information. While pursuing her master's degree at the University of the West Indies, Mona, she worked as a research assistant to Professor Shepard, where she commenced research on the life of Lucille Matherin Mayer. 
Stephanie also worked with Professor Shepard on country reports for the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, where she was first exposed to the United Nations system, human rights advocacy, and the call for reparations. Stephanie furthered her interest in advocacy and human rights to launch a campaign on colorism in Jamaica and was subsequently selected as a UN Fellow for the People of African Descent in 2019. She now focuses on research related to addressing the inequities in the education system and challenges faced by Jamaican students. Stephanie, please come and deliver your remarks. Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, Vice Chancellor Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Most Honorable PJ Patterson, former Prime Minister of Jamaica, His Excellency Judge Patrick Robert Robinson, Ambassador Gail Matherin, other members of the Diplomatic Corps, Professor Vereen Shepherd, <laughs> Mrs. Nadine Buckland, Dr. Dahlia Bean, Kabu Matkaru, Ms. Jeanette Campbell, Mrs. Latoya West Blackwood again. Other members of the family of Lucille Matherin Mayor, including David Matherin, who is here today, thank you. And also Mr. Adrian Matherin. Members of the University of the West Indies Management and Hierarchy, the UE Press Board of Directors, specially invited guests, including my family as well. Thank you for watching. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I was so grateful to Prof Shepard for inviting me to be a part of this process through which I've learned so much about a woman who I don't think many people know about. She is Lucille Matherin Mayor, May Walrond. We know that today is her birthday, or she would have been 97 today. She was born to a Guyanese father, Eric Walrond, and a Barbadian mother, Edith Cadogan. She had two sisters, both born in the US where her family stayed while she was born in Jamaica. Her mother, Edith Cadogan, actually left New York while pregnant and moved to Jamaica while you know, she was a few months pregnant. Her parents met in Panama during the construction of the Panama Canal where Eric was working. She, in Jamaica, went to the Morris Name Prep School and later the Wilmer School for Girls. She was posthumously inducted into the Wilmers Hall of Fame in 2019, as was mentioned earlier. She taught previously at Wilmers as well, not long after she graduated, and she actually stayed teaching while she was waiting to go off and do her studies in London because the World War was going on at the time and she could not travel to London to do those studies. There, she studied at the University of College of London and did her Bachelor of Arts and met her future husband, Guy Matherin, there. They moved to St. Lucia after she completed her studies. And in St. Lucia, she was part of the St. Lucia, they were both part of the St. Lucia, the Historical Society of St. Lucia. Guy set up a law firm and Lucille Matherin Mayer actually began teaching Caribbean history there at the St. Joseph's Convent. And that was the first time that Caribbean history was being taught. So Guy Matherin unfortunately passed away in a tragic accident in 1957. And Lucille Matherin Mayer returned to Jamaica with her three young children, Gail, David, and Adrian. She became the first warden of the newly built Mary C. Cole Hall and as we've mentioned earlier, that was where she spent just about 17 years of her career. She lectured history and successfully defended her thesis, as we mentioned earlier, and left Jamaica afterward to represent the country on the Commission on Social Development. She went on to work extensively with the United Nations and with the Jamaica Public, the Jamaica Diplomatic Corps as deputy and permanent representative. She led discussions and conferences on women and the developing world in the 70s and 80s, and was the first woman to serve as Under Secretary General of the United Nations, 
while she was Secretary General of the International Conference on the Question of Palestine. She also served as Jamaica's ambassador to Cuba, the first woman to do so. And she was also the head of the Women's Bureau. She was vital to the establishment of the Center for Gender and Development Studies between 1984 and 1989, where she was the first consultant regional coordinator. And then she was also senator and minister of state in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. She retired from public life and decided to concentrate on preparing her thesis for publication, but became ill and at the end of the 1990s, retired and was unable to do so and passed away in January of 2009. Her legacy lives on through her children, through oral history, through her writings, and through the many institutions and lives that she touched, many of whom are represented here today. I remember the first time Prof Shepard spoke to me about what is now the nearly 100 page biography that we are celebrating today. It was early September 2017, and she asked me to do a bit of research on Lucille Matherin Mayer for a three-page article. I said, okay, no problem. But I quickly realized that writing this article wouldn't be as simple as I thought, because despite all that this woman had published and accomplished in Jamaica and around the world, there was very little that was documented about her life her influences, philosophies, and the real behind the scenes experiences of how she became, how she was able to achieve all that she had done. The little that I was able to find pointed me to her daughter. And a good friend of mine, Natalie Rochester, was kind enough to introduce me to Ambassador Gail Matherin through her connections to the CARICOM Secretariat. That I think was the first breakthrough after which I spoke to her sons, David and Adrian, and eventually her niece, Jeanette. So most of what we know about her father came from Jeanette and the books that she loaned to us while we were researching. From her family, we learned about her roots and life's journeys. And at one point, even contemplating making a visit to the community where her maternal family came from in Cadogan in Hanover. We didn't make it there, but <laughs> we thought about it. We were given contacts for a spider web of contemporaries, close friends, former students, all of whom we interviewed and are listed in the acknowledgement of the book and will be recognized in the vote of thanks. This was perhaps one of the most fulfilling and sentimental parts of the research for me, reaching out to all the former U.S. students who resided at Mary Seacole Hall while she was warden, the very first warden of that hall, as I said, or the stories the students told. It's amazing how she handled the schemes of these young adults, but you'll have to read the book to hear about those. Some of the fondest memories came from her friends, including Irina Cousins, who welcomed me into her home and allowed me to interview her not once, but twice, and Peggy Antrobos, who I spoke to via Skype. That interview brought me to tears, and the, the, the most beautiful part of it was actually mentioned about three times in today's launch. After the interview, I spoke to Prof, and I said, Prof, Peggy told me the most beautiful story. We have to find somewhere to put it. And later on down the line, we both we both agreed that the most it was the most touching way to end the book. From visiting Luc Lucille Matthew and Mary's home and meeting her sons in person, we were given access to just around 40 boxes of books. And I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> it was about 40 boxes of books, lectures, letters, newspaper and magazine clippings, awards, notes from events, decades worth of material that was either written or read at some point by Lucille Matherin Mayer. It was through these files that we learned that she was writing a piece on her father and that she had been actively working on publishing her thesis, as Prof mentioned, with the help of Barry Higman. As you know, Prof Shepard and Prof Beckles were later able to assist her in realizing this dream. Prof Shepard and I split up these boxes and spent months perusing the material, paying close attention to the lectures that Lucille Matherin Mayer wrote, several of which revealed to us her opinions on equality, women's rights, the development agenda, and the evolving functions of and responsibilities of the organization where she spent the bulk of her diplomatic life, the United Nations. These lectures and notes are where we learned just beyond her time she was. I wasn't around in the 70s and 80s, but I could clearly pick up that her views on women's reproductive health were not shared by many during that era. And even now, 
or that her calls for greater participation of women in political and economic life were labeled as women's liberation and being ridiculed in many circles at the time. Within those papers, she just seemed so revolutionary and so brilliant. Truly, anyone who was able to sit in a room and hear her delivering those speeches live would have been very lucky. Through the joy and wonder from learning about Lucille Matherin Mayer, I know that Prof will agree with me when I say that we developed an emotional connection to her through her work and through the stories that her family, colleagues, and friends told us about her. We discovered far more than we thought we would. We shared the excitement as we looked at old photographs of Lucille Mayer from her niece, her children, and even a Jamaican female officer who happened to be serving in central officer while Lucille Matherin Mayer was there visiting. It wasn't until a few weeks, maybe a couple months into the research that Prof spoke to the press, Yui Press, and found that the project was really intended to be a 30,000 word essay, which would be published in the form of a biography. So, Prof and I sat at Courtly, I think it was Courtly one morning, and made a plan to complete the project. And I must express my gratitude to Prof Shepard here for giving me this opportunity to continue with the project and her patience with me as I started a full-time job not long after we started. And I was only able to work on the book during my free time. So this meant interviews on the phone during lunchtime or driving up to Mona for interviews after work, reading through speeches in the evenings and writing on weekends. Prof, thank you so much. After the bulk of work was done, Prof and I took to celebrating several times. We had a glass of wine together each time she sent in a new draft or saw the proofs or chose the cover or chose the photo for the cover or held the final copy in, her, in our hands. Whether here or even in Geneva, as we did, Prof insisted that we celebrate each win and mark of progress. And I'm grateful for that because we've been waiting so long to have this event. My outfit has been ready since last year. I'm thrilled to have been a part of telling the story of this phenomenal rebel woman. I hope that you all enjoy or have enjoyed reading it as much as Prof and I created, enjoyed creating it. Thank you. Lot of what was said in your address. One thing to note with Prof, nothing is ever a simple task. <laughs> you just get a phone call about an idea and it turns into a conference or, you know, stuff like that. So a lot of us learned that lesson. I'm sure that you are happy to be a part of this process and you look beautiful, by the way. All right. So Moving on the program now, and I'm happy that we're moving in good time. We are now at the point of presentation of the book to a dear member of Lucille Matherin Mayer's family, her niece, Miss Jeanette Campbell, who I've seen her on before, but I never knew the connection. As I said, this launch is very special. And so I'm going to invite her to come up along with Mrs. Nadine Buckland. Professor Shepard, you're going to be joining them. and. Stephanie, for this photo op. I mean, the COVID protocols, we know the spacing and all of that. So we're going to have that moment now of the presentation of the book. And while we have everybody being um, assembled, I will introduce Gina. She is a retired teacher who very much admired and adored her aunt, as she should. She was a phenomenal woman. She treasures the memories of, her, of the times her cousins spent together as children and teenagers. And she especially hold in her heart the many occasions that Lucille Matherin Mayer reached out to her across the decades offering a helping hand. That's so touching. <laughs> All right.
It is such a pleasure. <laughs> 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 Good afternoon, everybody. Just want to say to Professor Shepard, to Stephanie, to Yui Press, thank you very much. We're going to really treasure this. Really going to treasure this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that was uh, indeed a beautiful moment. Now we're at the point, a uh, very special point in the program of hearing from Ambassador Gail Matherin, who is the daughter of Lucille Matherin Mayor, the woman of the moment of this special occasion. And so Ambassador Gail Matherin has been Director General of the Office of Trade Negotiations, OTN, in the Caribbean Community Secretariat since no September 2009. She's also a member of the executive management team of the Secretariat. Prior to her uh, current appointment, Ambassador Matherin was permanent secretary and head of the Foreign Service in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade of Jamaica. Ambassador Matherin was educated at the University of the West Indies in, and in subsequent years attended hemispheric trade issues and trade policy courses at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Her work on trade issues, both nationally and regionally, has focused on ways in which trade agreements can assist small economies, such as those in, the, in CARICOM, in maximizing opportunities to improve their external trade performance. And so we move to hear from Ambassador Gail Matherin at this point. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, Madam Chair. I would like to acknowledge with great delight the presence of Honorable Mayor Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Professor Vereen Shepherd, Dr. Dahlia Bean, other members of the UWI community, representatives of the UWI press, specially invited guests, members of my family and friends, ladies and gentlemen. It is really a great pleasure to participate today in the launch of my mother's biography. I am joining you today from Barbados, where I'm currently based, and I do regret that the COVID-19 pandemic has not made it possible to be with you in Jamaica. But perhaps it's not coincidental that I am in Barbados. Those of you who may have read the biography will be aware of the Barbadian links in our family's story. Lucille's father, Eric Waldron, a well-known Bayesian name, was born of Barbadian parents who were working in Guyana at the time of his birth. Lucille's mother, Edith Cadogan, another well-known Bayesian name, was descended from a group of four small farmers who migrated to Jamaica from Barbados towards the end of the 19th century. They were looking for land to farm. They settled in Western Jamaica, and many years later, my extended family, including some of my cousins here today, all visited Cadogan Hill in Hanover, where family members still lived. Clearly, free movement of persons in the Caribbean was alive and well in those days. It is therefore a great pleasure for my family to join in welcoming the Honorable Mia Amor Motley this afternoon. I thank her profoundly for taking time out of her extremely busy schedule to be with us. I thank her for her warm remarks, and I'm confident that my mother would have celebrated her achievement in becoming the first female Prime Minister of Barbados, a Caribbean country that she, Lucille, knew very well and loved. In fact, the last trip I took with my mother 
was to Barbados to say farewell to another outstanding Barbadian, also a woman, Dame Nita Barrow, her dear friend. Thank you so much, Prime Minister. I also wish to recognize with deep appreciation the participation of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, in today's launch. And I thank him for his remarks. I am sure he knows that he has a special place in my family's hearts. Sir Hilary, together with Professor Vereen Shepherd, approached us during my mother's illness, indicating their willingness to edit her doctoral thesis a historical study of women in Jamaica, 1655 to 1844, for publication. My mother had always wanted to publish her thesis, but her illness prevented her doing this once she had retired. Thanks to the generosity of these two distinguished historians and the university press, this publication became a reality in 2006. Thank you again, Sir Hilary, for being with us today. Today would have marked Lucille's 97th birthday, and this date was chosen for the launch of her biography by its author, Professor Vereen Shepherd. She had hoped that this would have been a face-to-face -face event, but as we are beginning to learn that virtual events can also be meaningful and profound. This thoughtful touch on the part of Professor Vereen Shepherd reflects the way in which she approached her research for the biography. Not only did she and her research assistant, Stephanie Sewell, comb through boxes of Lucille's papers, which were very loosely organized, but she also approached family members and friends with sensitivity and discretion in trying to get a sense of what Lucille was all about. Her meticulous and thorough research has led to the production of the biography being launched today. I believe that this is a fitting tribute to my mother's work and thoughts, indeed to her philosophy and view of Jamaica, the Caribbean, and the wider world she so enthusiastically embraced. I also believe Lucille would have thought it most appropriate that her biography was written by such a distinguished historian and a woman. To Vereen, Professor Vereen Shepherd, my family expresses its deepest appreciation to you. Stop, stop. And I am not stop. sure that we can find the words to describe the pleasure in and the satisfaction with the way in which you have recorded Lucille's life and work. I also wish to thank Stephanie Sewell for all her hard work in supporting the development of this publication. I also would like to thank Dr. Dahlia Bean for her comments this afternoon. Again, I would also like to thank the UWI Press for publishing the Caribbean Biography Series, which ensure that the contributions of so many Caribbean personalities are recorded for posterity, and of course for including Lucille in that series. Thank you also for all your work in making today's launch a reality. Appreciation also goes to the wider university community, particularly at the Mona campus, in arranging today's launch. And finally, I am so pleased that members of my family, including my brothers and cousins, my mother's godchildren, as well as many friends, have been able to join us today. I also know that some of Lucille's good friends going back many, many years are also online. Thank you so much for sharing this occasion with us. I can only urge everyone to get a copy of the book. It really does make for good reading. Thank you so much. For those of you, okay, this is easier. <laughs> For those of you who noticed the portrait in the background, I hope you saw how beautiful Lucille Matherin Mayer was. That was a painting done by her friend, 
Caroline Barrow, and it was done while they were both young people in London. And so uh, I know that um, Lucille loved art. When Stephanie and I visited the home and we were shown around by David and, and Adrian, we saw all these beautiful paintings. So I know that Gail is absolutely delighted that she was able to show that painting in the background and to thank Carlin, who was actually a longtime resident of uh, Barbados. It is now my turn then to thank all those who helped to make this launch such a fantastic event. I absolutely enjoyed it. Our excellent moderator, Ms. Latoya West Blackwood, the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Honorable Mia Moore Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, whose generosity knows no bounds. I'm just thrilled that you were able to be with us today. Lucille Matherin, Mayor's daughter, Ambassador Gail Matherin, whose support has been invaluable. Dr. Delia Bean, who launched the work into being. Kabu Mad Keru, who shared her poem on Mama Enid. And some of you who know about the Coral Gardens massacre would recognize that story of how Mama Enid had to hide her husband from police by sewing him up in a mattress. That's a true story. Thank you so much, Kabu. I had the honor of launching your book of poetry, Making Kenke from Memory. It was such an honor. You're my St. Mary's sister. We come from Africa. Well, you know, come from Africa. I come from, you come from Hopewell and I come from Africa on both sides of that plantation in St. Mary. And thank you so much, uh, Miss Nadine Buckland, Acting Manager, Managing Director of the Press. I thank my family for their support. I know that scattered as they are throughout Jamaica and the diaspora, they are watching right now. And special thanks go to my husband, Bramwell, and my sons, Dwayne and Dean, for their unconditional love and support. I recall when I got this scholarship to Cambridge, and I, I, you know, it wasn't the first scholarship I was getting. I had gotten a scholarship to actually study you know, I had met Rodney, Walter Rodney, so I wanted to go to source <laughs> to study, you know, African history. And then I looked at my two little ones and I thought, uh-uh, this is not the time for me to leave them. But when Cambridge Scholarship came up, uh, I said to my boys who were older, I said, do you think people are going to think that I abandon you? And they said, mommy, don't be silly. I'm just, we are just looking forward to um, coming to London and to Cambridge every, every holiday. <laughs> so, you know, I thank them so much for their love and support. I thank the staff of the regional headquarters, in particular, Ms. Florence Francis and her technical assistant, Devane McCarthy over there, and the technical team of UWI TV, especially Jamani Dunn and Janet Carew. What do we do with our UWI TV and the Irish Q technical team? They have been exceptional. I found the technical marketing and support staff of the UWI Press and the Center for Reparation Research for their invaluable support in organizing this event. You saw John Shorter there coming up each time. Somebody spoke to make sure that we observe all the COVID-19 protocols. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ajanel Solomon. Gabriel Hemmings, Floyd Williams, who is there, who um, did so much to help to ensure that we were safe here, and Janela Roberts. Um, they all went beyond the call of duty, the staff of the UWI Press, the staff of the Center for Reparation Research. And my friend, Leticia Bohard Singh, you may have seen her on screen on and off. She, stand, she was standing, oh, she still is standing by because, you know, we have to have proxy moderator um, recorded speeches just in case things happen at these blended events. I express deep appreciation to all who contributed to making this biography a reality. And yes, Stephanie, to be honest, I wasn't paying much attention when Siobhan said, um, can you write something on Lucille Matherin Mayer? And I thought, okay, sure, um, why not? I've been studying her for a long time. 20 pages, okay, fine. <laughs> Only to realize I was supposed to do a book. So thank you, Stephanie, you were so generous uh, in, in helping. I thank, of course, Lucille Matherin Mayer's family, Adrian and David, because they ensured that all the documents we needed could be accessed. And I thank Gail and Jeanette because their historical memory 
filled in where documentation failed. I also express my appreciation to Sean Mockian and the staff of the UWI archives, to Nadine Spence of Mary C. Cole Hall um, of the UWI, for allowing research assistant Stephanie Sewell and me to access some of Lucille Matherin's uh, underutilized papers. Because I think after she died, some of the papers um, were donated to Mary C. Cole Hall. So we were able to go there and to use those. And not to be left out is the staff of the UWI Library in the West in this collection, where actually her papers are being housed. And we have more papers uh, to be added to that collection. And I know they will launch that uh, in the future. With this treasure trove of documentation, along with oral history sources, the task of getting access to the philosophy and opinions of this rebel woman was not very difficult. Stephanie and I also thank all others who allowed us to interview them so that we could fill out the missing parts of Mayor's life that could not be gleaned from other sources. I see Jay Judge, His Excellency Patrick Robinson, past students and colleagues, Professors Elsa Leoraini, Barbara Bailey, Mervyn Morris, Carl Campbell, Maureen Warner Lewis, and Marlene Hamilton. Miss Helen Morris, a Mary Seacole resident while Lucille was warden. Dr. Velma Pollard, Ambassadors Evadne Ruby Coy, Patricia Durant, the late Patricia Durant, Sheila Seely Monteith, Maria Dembowska, and Richard Bernal. Lucy's close friends, Dr. Pe Peggy Antrobus and Ambassador Irina Cousins were critically involved in this project. In addition, we benefited from Professor Edward Ball's 1993 interview with Matherin Mayer, which helped to fill in many of the gaps, especially about her early life. Other participants in this journey of love, this oral history dimension of the project, were Beverly Anderson Duncan, Marjorie Wiley, Elaine Melbourne, Mavis Gilmore, Sonia Mills, Beverly Phillips, former Prime Minister of Jamaica, the um, Most Honorable P.J. Patterson, and the late Ambassador and High Commissioner of St. Kitts and Nevis to Jamaica, Cedric Harper. Stephanie, I'm so happy that we actually, um, you know, went to visit him before he passed. Finally, I express thanks to Mr. Ian Randall for invaluable editorial assistance in the final stages of writing the book. I express my thanks to research assistants, Christina Neal and Shafiq Sam, who served time in the Center of Reparation Research for a while. And everybody who is there know that they are drawn into all the projects and uh, everything that I get up to, <laughs> they, they are drawn in. And above all, Stephanie, you have been so important to this project. Stephanie took on this project with passion and zeal and went beyond the call of duty to ensure that the work was completed. Indeed, Stephanie, I regard you as co-author. Thanks everyone. And here we are wrapping up what has been a very special occasion in many ways. Uh, Prof has said it all in terms of the thanks, but I would just like to close out by sharing some points to take away, some calls to action from this launch. And I'll start out with asking us to reflect on the stories that have not been told. If Lucille Matherin Mayer was such a powerful woman who contributed so much, if it had not been for this series and the work of Professor Shepard and Stephanie Sewell in terms of documenting this story along with the support of our family, I dread to imagine that we would have missed out on that. And so it calls us to think about all the other stories that are left to be told. And so we look forward to the next in the series from the Caribbean Biography series on Amy Cesare, who I think a lot of people, are, he is another figure that not many people um, in terms of the general audience, not necessarily the scholars and, and the academic world might not be aware of. And so we look forward to that eighth book in the series. We also think about the contribution of Lucille Matherin Mayer in terms of her life and legacy to what happens today. We had a very special 
delivery in terms of remarks from Barbados' first female prime minister. And I think that that was really another special moment today in terms of almost a full circle. Um, and also just thinking about what is to come in terms of the next generation. And also PM Motley's call to us to think about the next era, well, actually the present and going into the future in terms of how we make such works more accessible to a wider audience through audiovisual format. I think it is a great call to action to our creative and cultural industries practitioners. And thinking about the fact that great battles are not won overnight, so the work continues. And finally, nothing about us without us. I think that that's a powerful point on which we can all reflect and celebrate today's launch. Indeed, Lucille, you did all that. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this very special launch. We thank you for your time. We thank all the program participants and see you at the next launch. Before we go, though, one last thing. Remember that this biography and the others in the series are available now at a special 50% discount using the promotional code 03SMR21 at the checkout via uapress.com. And you can also contact their marketing team for special purchases for community libraries, schools, etc. Thank you all again for joining us and see you at the next book launch. <laughs>